Uh, so, my name's Carolyn Jones. Um, I'm from uh, Ngāti Kahununu, and uh, my connections are just a little bit south of here in Wairo, and I grew up in, in Hawke's Bay, uh, so I live now in Wellington. And I have uh, worked mostly in the area of uh, Treaty of Waitangi issues uh, and treaty claims and settlements, and have been working over the last few years on our claims and settlement negotiations in Wairua. And so I thought that um, that I might talk a little bit about the kinds of possibilities that, um, that I see coming out of the treaty settlement process uh, and the, the kinds of options or, or um, initiatives that, that could be pursued that aim towards social and economic revitalisation aim to, to provide pathways out of poverty that, that come out of that settlement process. But uh, I think they're also applicable not only to that Treaty of Waitangi context and to Māori communities, but there's a lot, I think, which applies also to other kinds of communities. Where, in fact, wherever people um, see themselves as a community and see they have their issues uh, around poverty or, or wanting to address um, issues around economic and social revitalisation. So this is um, regional GDP per capita. This comes from our, our MB report uh, on looking at, at the East Coast uh, economic development issues. And just a couple of things to note. I don't, the, this is the New Zealand kind of uh, GDP per capita in the middle here. Um, Gisborne is actually... Uh, and on these statistics is, is higher than the New Zealand average, but when you have Gisborne and Hawke's Bay together, it's slightly lower than the New Zealand average. But one of the things that I want to point out was that looking at, at the growth in employment here, we see, uh, again, New Zealand here uh, in the east coast, um, the red bar there is, is significantly lower. And then uh, if you're looking at the... The, uh, the sort of later period in that 2007 to 2012, you can see actually the growth in employment in areas like Hawke's Bay East Coast, um, Northland, Gisborne, uh, Napier and Wairau, uh very low. So one of the things that I just want to, why I wanted to show you those graphs is to point out that it's fine to think about GDP and of course that provides an economic basis for some of the things that are important in terms of poverty reduction. But as Garoum has also talked about, it's not, it's not the only factor, and so it's important also to think about um, not only GDP, but, but also employment and income in these areas. And uh, just from the, the last uh, census, the 2013 census, uh, I, I know the statistics in terms of unemployment has Gisborne higher unemployment rate than the rest of New Zealand average, uh, has a median income in Gisborne uh, which is lower than the rest of New Zealand. So important to think about those other factors and also the local examples of this. So looking at the country as a whole is one thing, but important to recognise that there are distinct local economies and effects there as well. So I would say that we need to focus on other measures other than, than GDP and also to think very carefully about that local situation too. And I also want to pick up on, on some of the other things that, that Garul was saying about the, 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 the idea of well-being and, and, and how that is associated or how that is connected and impacted upon by, by poverty. And one of the ideas that I've been really interested to come across was research which dealt with this idea of um, a kind of bandwidth in, 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 in the kind of uh, socio-economic terms. So the idea being that um, actually being in poverty actually increases the stress that people are under and means that the choices that they make uh, are limited and constrained in, in quite fundamental ways. That, that kind of stress 
also has an impact on people's health in itself as well as other issues around access to health and those kinds of things. Um, but this idea of bandwidth is that you know, we all have a kind of range of, of capability in terms of just the way we think as, as humans of being able to deal with the different issues that we get faced with in our lives. Now, if, if people are in poverty, what it means is that a large amount of that bandwidth gets taken up with focus and the stress of trying to manage kind of really basic issues around um, material well-being, access to services and those kinds of things. And it, it limits the amount of space we have as a kind of thinking function for making other kinds of choices and decisions. So that is a really constraining um, impact on the way that, that people are able to engage and, and participate in, in our public life um, because of the, the amount of this kind of bandwidth of our thinking that, that um, ends up having to focus on those very practical and urgent issues. One of the things that I wanted to note is that there's a lot of research from in particular the United States around indigenous groups there and their economic development and that draws quite a, a strong connection between the well-being, not only in economic terms, but the well-being of those communities and their ability to exercise kind of self-determination. And, and this, this again comes back to the idea that if communities are empowered to make these decisions for themselves, then they tend to make better decisions for their communities than, than others would. And that's partly because um, they know their communities better, they know the way their communities work, uh, but also that the consequences of, of poor decisions, there's an accountability there that is much closer uh, closer to home, so that if you're a member of that community and you're making decisions, and those are poor decisions for your your community members, then you have a di you're directly impacted by that. Whereas if someone in Wellington say is making decisions, and those are poor decisions for a community here in Gisborne, um, there's not such, there's not the kind of close link and close accountability that comes from having that decision making. Uh, closer to the community. And there's also, I think, an important part of, of the treaty settlement process then is also thinking about this is, there's a need to recognise not only uh, the inequality uh, and to address inequality, but also to think about how to recognise difference and the different needs of communities, and again that's something that we've already heard a little about this morning. We've just been through uh, a couple of years negotiating a settlement uh, in Wairau and part of what we're wanting to achieve there is, yes, there, there is going to be a commercial or economic financial component to that settlement and that is going to be important for providing a platform for some of the aspirations we have. But also it's, it's not simply about that commercial imperative, so there are also factors around us having input into um, government decision making and policy at various levels, both at the local government level and also uh, with central government, and one of the mechanisms that that we're wanting to establish is uh, what we've, we've called a social and economic revitalisation strategy, which the idea being that we will um, bring the number of social service agencies together to meet with us to work on planning and setting priorities and reporting and accountability back to us, um, specifically targeting the the wide or region. You know that's that's where our our home people are. And so I think these these settlements uh, are very much the the benefits of them. While the monetary component of them is important in terms of setting up that platform, the benefits come from a much wider range of mechanisms. And we see these kinds of mechanisms not only with us in Wairua, but Tuhoi, for example, have a, a, so, a services management plan, again trying to pull together the range of government agencies that are involved in social service delivery to focus on issues that are particular to them in their region. 
but also building into that the idea of working with their own cultural values. So thinking about, um, for example, the way in which they understand whānau uh, and the role of whānau in supporting other members in the community is built into the work that, that, that um, in the social services that government is supporting and providing as well, so that it's tailored specifically to their community um, and really trying to make a difference there. I just wanted to talk about uh, a couple of examples of the kinds of initiatives that I think are really important and that come from this idea of, of communities themselves having a, uh, control or self-determination about the kinds of decisions that they make. A couple from, from New Zealand, first of all, um, one from, from around this, this way, uh, and one of the things that uh, Ngāti Paro did coming out of their settlement is they had an arrange they formed an arrangement with uh, Contact Energy, um, and some of you might know about this, uh, it's called Ngāti Power, um, and what this arrangement does, in some ways it, it's kind of a loyalty scheme for customers, so if members of Ngāti Paro sign up, um, not only do they get uh, a, around a 20% discount on their power bills, but also for every, every Ngāti Paro member that signs up to this scheme, um, $50 goes into a fund which goes to support uh, the local marae to pay their power bills. So it, it, it's, it's really using the leverage of, of the numbers that Ngāti Paro have and, and the collective entity that, identity that they have coming out of their settlement to be able to provide that kind of economic benefit in quite a practical way. The other example from New Zealand is um, from Ngaitahu, and Ngaitahu have uh, what I think was quite an innovative savings scheme. It's called Fai Rawa, and essentially this works a bit like Kiwi Saver. Um, so Ngaitahu provide matching contributions uh, for their members uh, for saving schemes, and those can be used towards things like education, um, money towards your first home or retirement. So that's, again, a, way, a very practical way in which Ngaitahu are, are supporting their members um, and providing them with these, these different kinds of options. I just want to also touch on a couple of examples from the United States because I, um, I think there's some really interesting examples there. Uh, there have been some, um, some groups in the United States, indigenous groups, who have, as really just as a matter of, of taking control over some decision making have made big changes uh, in the well-being of their communities. There have been groups who have, um, ha have significantly reduced their infant mortality rate just by doing things like providing all their members with, um, uh, with car seats for children, you know, in infant car seats. And, and that has had a huge impact on infant mortality rates there. Um, there have been groups who have, when they have taken over uh, the emergency services, of course we're talking in the United States on, 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 a, on a reservation, so on a big area of, of uh, a territory there, where they reduced the, the response time from an average of, of 45 minutes to an average of 15 minutes, and they did that just by, when they took over the emergency services, um, instead of making the, emergen the emergency workers leave the emergency response vehicles at a central point, they allowed them to take them back to their own homes, um, and that meant that they were quicker to get to the vehicles, but they were also often closer to where um, they needed to get to as well. And so it's just that kind of decision making that's really important. And the final example that I wanted to touch on, I have the logo up here for the uh, Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. And this is in Oregon. And this is a group where they had set up, they had a number of business uh, enterprises that they had established, um, part of which they wanted to try and increase employment for their members on the reservation. But one of the things that they found was that the members were having difficulty simply getting to work, that people didn't have transport, uh, and so they were either not able to take up jobs in, in the businesses that the, 
the, the tribes themselves were running, um, or they were <coughs> taking quite dangerous risks in terms of getting to and from work, walking along the sides of motorways um, uh, uh, you know, at all hours of the day and night and those kinds of things. So what this group did is they said, well, so part of the thing that's missing here is um, facilitating our people to get to their places of work and home again safely. And so they partnered with um, the, the state to provide funding for a transport system, a bus system, but not only a bus system, they also provided taxi vouchers for people who needed to get to work um, you know, outside of the hours that the buses were running or for their elders in their community who needed to access taxis as well. And so there were subsidised taxi services. It was also provided to people uh, uh, not only on the reservation but off the reservation as well and not only to their tribal members. And that um, increased the, the kind of feasibility of running this programme but it also increased the sense of identity of this community and it gave it a real visible presence in the wider community uh, and really again supported that wider well-being so it had a practical impact but also um, supporting the wider well-being of the community in those kinds of ways. So those are just a kind of few examples um, and as I say but really the point that I want to stress is that the importance of, of looking at Poverty in the context of those wider well-being issues, um, not only the, the material economic uh, issues that are that are also very urgent, and to think really of of this connection between the decision-making authority and the kind of impact on the community. So to think, I guess, more broadly of poverty as being a, a political problem, um, not only a, a kind of economic problem as well. Kia ora koutou.